So welcome everybody to the March Measure D meeting. Uh, my name is Adrian Cotter. I'm one of three on the agenda committee uh, with uh, Myra Redman and John Bauer. Um, uh, I think at this point, uh, we're pretty good at the Zoom, so I don't think I need to go into any, I don't see many new people, um, but feel free to uh, use the um, Zoom somehow to raise your hand. Uh, but if for some reason we don't call on you to uh, speak out, please uh, please interrupt because uh, sometimes we miss things. Um, so I think uh, we can go around and with a round of introductions, I'll call people off uh, to give their intro, intro uh, and then we can move into the agenda. So I will uh, start with David. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, David Wofford, a co-chair of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And uh, I, I'd like to have the Orton development people come before us again and uh, give us a status report. And I uh, also envision uh, them opening up in some form or fashion where we have an opportunity to present to the public what Measure DD has done and accomplished through through that facility. Thank you, David. Uh, Bill? Bill Threlfall, Waterfront Action. <clears throat> uh, John? John Bowers. John Bowers, Agenda Committee and Lake Merritt Institute. Uh, John Klein. Yeah, John Klein, uh, Coalition of Advocates for Lake Merritt and a Brooklyn Basin resident. Welcome. Uh, Mandolin. Uh, good evening, Mandolin Kader Redman, Executive Director with the Oakland Parks and Recreation Foundation, uh, here tonight in support of my colleague Hazel Tesoro. Uh, we are the administrators for the coalition meetings. And Hazel, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, uh, just uh, Hazel and I'm from OPRF, and as Mandolin said, I'm helping with the meeting tonight. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Myra and Bob? Uh, Myra Redman, Agenda Committee, LMI, Weep Warrior. Bob Redman, Essex Community Action Committee and Lake Merritt Coalition, Conservancy Coalition. Thank you. Uh, Katie. Katie Noonan, um, Rotary Nature Center Friends Co-Chair and Lake Merritt Institute. Uh, Rick. Rick Rickard, Bike East Bay. Uh, Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca Dar, Oakland Public Works. Welcome, Project Bowen. Manager, Project and Grant Manager, and the Project Manager for the uh, the uh, Peralta Park replanting and irrigation project. Uh, did you just call on me, Vince? I did, yeah. Okay, yeah, Vince, Vince Geronimo, uh, resident uh, adjacent to uh, Lake Merritt. Uh, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Acker with the City of Oakland Finance Department. Uh, welcome again. Uh, James. James Ben, uh, uh, Coalition of Advocates for Like Merit. And I noticed two items missing from the agenda. So when you open up the agenda, I'd like to bring those up. Okay. Uh, G. Her G. Harold. Good evening. My name is G. Harold Duffy. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Oakland. Welcome. Uh, Terry. Uh, you're on mute, Terry. Uh, Terry Fashing, Acting Manager for the Watershed and Stormwater Management Division and Acting DD Bond Manager. Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll move on to agenda changes and additions. Uh, James? You said you had a, there was a couple of things missing? Yes, thank you. 
uh, yeah, uh, our last meeting authorized uh, the item on governance, and I did submit the document uh, in advance, and I don't see it on the agenda. Uh, it's on the agenda at 8.45. At 8.45, okay. So maybe I'm looking at a draft agenda, I guess. Um, and also uh, the draft agenda I'm looking at doesn't show the election. I think tonight we elect uh, the uh, the agenda committee. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, first thing on the agenda, actually. Okay, uh, all right. My agenda is, I must have printed out the draft that was early. Okay, thank you, sorry. Uh, no worries. All right, good to confirm. Um, I'll put the link to the agenda in the chat. Um, uh, we had two, uh, uh, there were some minutes changes for November and January. Um, uh, is there any, um, uh, any any uh, any comments on those agendas, uh, or can we move their approval? All right. Well, hearing. Nothing, I move approval. Uh, okay. Uh, any objection or second? Second. Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, agenda committee members. Um, do we have anybody uh, who is, would like to join the agenda committee? Uh, so currently, it is myself, uh, John Bowers, and Myra Redman. And um, I think we're all willing to continue to serve, but we would also welcome welcome some new blood as well. All right. Well, I don't see anyone raising their hand. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to uh, raise my hand. Okay. To, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. All right. I, I move the uh, uh, re-election of the President Agenda Committee. Uh, is there a second? Okay, I see a second from David. Um, uh, is there any any uh, any nay votes on the current agenda commission committee? Okay, hearing none. Um, so uh, the first item on the agenda beyond that was the separated bike lane project. Terry, is, I don't see, oh, is Char Charlie, Charles, is that Charles Reen, right? Yes, that would be a DOT project, Charlie Reen. <clears throat> um, All right. Well, uh, the Charles, the Charles who's on the call, uh, is that Charles? Is that Charlie Ream, or is is that someone else? You could come off mute and introduce yourself if not. All right. Well, I guess I'm gonna pass it over to you then, Terry. Um, I guess we'll have to reach out to the, that department again and reschedule. Oh, sorry. They might be just coming on right at 735 because that's the time that I told them. Oh, gotcha. I, I mean, I told okay. them we started at 710 and we do intros, but they might just be coming on for, you know, their set time. Okay, fair enough. Um, so would anyone want to do their announcements in the interim time?
Uh, David, if you're talking, you're on mute. Uh, um, so Katie, do you want to talk about your is Katie frozen? Uh, Katie, do you want to talk about the, your next upcoming Rotary Nature Center? Lost her. Uh, David, do you know what the? Uh, next? Could I uh, make See, a you know, I didn't job? understand. I, I'm not sure. I didn't understand the question. I must have missed something there. What? What? Where? So our our 735 people have not shown up yet. Um, so I was suggesting we move through some of our announcements, which are usually quicker items in that <laughs> interim, so that we're not wasting that time and just sitting around and waiting. Um, would it be possible so to unfortunately, move and I can't hurry, up. hurry up and have the, the bike folks come after her? Or is uh, that too too disruptive? I didn't hear I didn't hear the uh, the first part of what you said. I'm sorry, Rebecca. So I just was proposing that we move Terry up to right now. And that the bike folks who were scheduled for 735 would pick up when Terry has finished with her presentation. Uh, Terry's presentation usually takes up the bulk of the time, and we had specifically uh, granted their request to start early. So, um, That's why hey, I proposed these smaller items. Sounds like we could get some of these announcements out uh, earlier and, qu and quicker out of the way. And I imagine Katie Noonan is out there. If she can get her mic working and ready, I will. Hello, take hello. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Katie. Okay. Well, to sad to say, I am transitioning from my car into my house, and so I'm just going to take me at least five minutes or more to get my computer inside set up, which is where I can access the uh, links and stuff I would share in chat. So I'm sorry, I can't, okay. I'm, I'm going to have to sign off for about 10 minutes and then come back. We'll okay. come back. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Adrian. Yeah. I will take this opportunity to reiterate what I said in my introduction that I would like to have Orton development come before me. <laughs> and uh, also like to envision in the uh, bringing that uh, facility back online, uh, some form of fashion where we can uh, show, uh, communicate to the general public the work and uh, accomplishments of measure, the Measure DD coalition. Okay, we okay. can Thank get you. that on the agenda. Uh, John, did you want to talk about Estuary Park? John Klein? Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to share a graphic? Uh, Hazel should be able to grant you share access. Uh, yes, you can share now. Okay, how what what how do I do that? I'm sorry, I haven't done it. Which option at the bottom? Uh, share screen. Uh, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be able to navigate it here. So um, let's forget that. Um, and I'll just get into talking about it visually. I don't know how to do it quickly. So um, the item on the agenda with regard to Estuary Park, we recently found out that Signature Property, the developer at uh, Brooklyn Basin, um, is, in, is going to have a meeting with the City of Oakland, a pre-application meeting they, to, in, in order to gain entitlement to put 600 units of housing on half of the estuary park parcel. And if I had, if I could show you the graphic, if you've seen the graphics of that, half of it sometimes is, all, sometimes all of it is shown as uh, estuary park. Sometimes it's half of it is shown um, as estuary park. Another half is shown as um, uh, parcel N. <clears throat> so as, as you all know, you are heavily involved with the estuary park development you know, the, the re, uh, renovation and upgrade of the full parcel. And uh, James and I were talking and we think that it's necessary to get out ahead of this. There is no application at this point. There are no entitlements at this point, but we think it's, we thought it was necessary for a group of people that are heavily involved with estuary park planning. I mean, there's an ER, EIR in process being reviewed now, 
So there's a group of people that should go down and meet with the planners involved. To, to um, it, This is not adversarial. Don't expect it to be adversarial, but I think it's important to get down there and let them know in full and updated that basically the community through all the processes that have gone on expects that the outcome there will be a uh, multi-purpose park, public park for the entire area. And um, so the, the ideal thing at this meeting, in my opinion, would be to identify two or three or four people who are interested in pursuing that. Um, again, it's not adversarial, but to, to go in and just say, here's what's planned there. It's been going on for a long time. And really, um, it's just completely inappropriate at this point to um, do something else there. And how, whatever they need to do, if they just need to say no to this application, that would be the best outcome for us. So that's that's what I'm here for on this agenda. OK, so interested. Uh... Uh, I'll, I'll let uh, James and then G. Harold Fluffy talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when we and when we found out about this uh, request by the developer to talk to staff about swapping uh, land, uh, 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 basically taking up half of what we are planning for uh, to be the new estuary park. This goes back to a city council meeting about a year ago when uh, the developer has put through a request to add some 600 additional units to the Brooklyn Basin uh, development project, which was approved for 3,100 units initially. The council uh, did give approval for the additional 600 units, but in no place in the discussion in the council or in the agenda report or any place else was it ever mentioned? There was no specific parcel mentioned. I understand that in some of the discussion, it was understood by some members of the council that the developer would be adding units in some of the buildings that were presently planned so that he would take up the 600 additional units that way. But there's nowhere that any new additional unit was proposed. The developer refers to a uh, uh, parcel in, there is no parcel in listed on any of the original uh, uh, Brooklyn Basin approval documents. So we don't know where this came from, but uh, but Measure DD has been very involved with planning of that entire parcel uh, with the demolition of that commercial use that used to be running on Embarcadero that entire parcel as, as the new estuary park. And so we think that it's necessary that the DD coalition get out in front of this, as John was saying, and, uh, and <clears throat> have meetings with staff if necessary, but get to the bottom of this and make it clear that estuary park parcel is not for swap for housing. So uh, I'll stop there. There are a number of questions that need to be answered, uh, and we can share those with whoever uh, we would like to request that a task uh, force uh, be designated to follow this item up, meet with staff, and do whatever is necessary to to get this uh, this question cleared up. In the behalf of Measure DD, thank you. Uh, Myra or Bob. Myra and I nominate James to head the task force. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to be on this task force? Uh, John and Naomi, uh, we have been communicating as members of COM, and we would like uh, any other members of the task force who would be interested. Bill uh, Trelpo, uh was very involved in in our our direction on the estuary park parcel i think bill would be tremendously important to have be a part of this task task group if he's well, willing i i nominate bill in his absence i don't see him he's here oh you're here okay uh, uh well uh, i think uh 
I think we can let people um, reach out to James who are interested. Um, um, Mr. Duffy, would you like to? Uh... Yes, thank you so much. I want to first say thank you for all your time and dedication and being good stewards of, of monitoring the Measure DD resources. It certainly will have a significant impact to the future of Oakland. But what I wanted to do tonight was to <clears throat> come and try to sort of explain the process and the, and the conditions that we're currently under. Obviously, you guys are all aware that the economy has changed from where we were five years ago to where we are today. One of the things I'd like you to do is to let Terry provide you with some facts about what is potentially going to be proposed by uh, the, the developer. And once again, it is, it is an application or a potential application. There is nothing set in stone. There are no deals made. Um, there was no, uh, there are no increases to already any, any pre-approved plans. So one of the things we have to do is we have to look at realistically what the proposal might be and then strategize to make sure that it is consistent with the overall goals of Measure DT, DD and open space and providing access to the community. So I would really appreciate it if you had an opportunity to listen to Terry before you decide to establish a working group, an ad hoc group, a committee to, to run down and talk to City Hall. I think that's a good idea, but what you should do is have the facts first before you go uh, to address the, any issue because there may be opportunities in this entire cycle to get you exactly what you want. And not to say once again, remember, the economy is a completely different economy now than it was five, 10 years ago. And so we have to be flexible to listen, to listen to see what we can and cannot do in the future. So Terry has been a tremendous steward and advocate of all your ideas and concepts so far. And she's committed to ensure that your overall goals and objectives are realized and that you, uh, as good stewards of Measure DD, that we, we will protect the interests of the community as we move forward. So Terry, if you, if you can allow Terry an opportunity at some point in time to provide you with a quick overview of where we are, and then we can take some questions. Okay, so I think it uh, sounds like we'll pause on that. So Terry, it's part of your presentation coming up a little bit or, or is it the future? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Thank you, Mr. Duffy. Can we can can we hear from Terry uh, on this question? Since, uh, so uh, Terry is going to speak to it as part of her presentation, but I think we're going to first move on to uh, the um, Lakeshore separated bike lane project to get okay. us on track on our agenda. That's okay. All right, uh, Charlie Reams, Jane May. I think there was one of the Christopher Diano. Hi, Adrian. You thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for having us here today. Um, my colleague Charlie and I are here to talk about an upcoming uh, paving project on Lakeshore Avenue. Um, and Chris is our engineer, but he is not here today. And Char but Charlie and I will be able to answer any questions that um, any of you might have about the design of the project um, and any more engineering questions. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so that you all can see the slides here. Give me one second. Um, okay, are you all able to see my screen? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. 
Um, so the um, I'm just going to present a few slides about the background of this um, Lake Merritt, uh, sorry, Lakeshore Avenue um, separated bike lanes project. A little bit of history about Lakeshore Avenue here. Um, the last time that Lakeshore Avenue was improved was actually a Measure DD um, funded project where um, the city made some improvements to the, the lake path um, and also reduced the, you can see here on the satellite view, um, in 2008, it was actually two lanes in each direction. And that project in 2008 reduced um, Lakeshore Avenue to three lanes. So one lane going each way and then a turning lane in the middle. Um, it, they also added a lot of street trees and um, improved the path and added some lighting. Um, mm -hmm. So Lakeshore Avenue and Lake Merritt is a destination for people in the city, um, residents who are living nearby and people who come from all over. Um, there have been changes in the past that have been contentious and there's not always agreement on what is the best way to make Lake Merritt accessible to everyone. Um, most recently, there was there were a couple of projects involving metered parking on Lakeshore Avenue, vending, uh, permitted vending, that um, uh, we want to be able to kind of lean on the engagement with the community members um, through those projects and also just make sure that everyone, all these different groups with different needs can still have access to Lake Merritt and Lake Shore Avenue. Um, that being said, this project is uh, has really been motivated, um, has really, the timeline, we've been, been able to speed it up a lot um, in response to a tragic crash in which a four-year-old died uh, last year um, on Lakeshore Avenue. Um, and there were some rapid response uh, here, the slides. Um, there were some responses from a rapid response team. We were able to put up some signs um, saying check for bikes um, when people are opening their car doors. Uh, this is an example of a sticker that's available in three different languages, um, just to remind drivers as they're opening their doors to watch out for bicyclists. Um, and following this, we are, we were able to move this paving project that was initially scheduled for 2027 and ex, um, really accelerate that process. We were able to line it up with an EB mud project that is starting this fall. Um, Lake Merritt, sorry, uh, the Lakeshore Avenue is currently three lanes and it's going to reduce it to two um, in order to make space for a two-way separated bike path on the lake side of Lakeshore Avenue. Um, there's not going to be any substantial impacts to parking, and I believe there are actually a few more parking spaces than before. Um, there's going to be some changes to the bus boarding situation, including adding bus boarding islands. Um, crossings are going to be shortened a little bit through the use of islands or curb extensions. Um, and I'll have Charlie give a more detailed look into some of those elements um, in a little bit. Um, but for today and over March and a little bit into April, um, we are talking to community members, we're talking to, to you guys here today, um, and we're talking to other groups within the city just to make sure that um, this project can meet everyone's needs as, as much as possible. Um, in April, we'll be going door to door with businesses um, and vendors and other, um, other important kind of, other important stakeholders that are fronting Lakeshore Avenue. Um, and we're also gonna be distributing mailers to residents um, so that they can all respond and learn about this project. Um, 
I think something that we would like to hear from you all today is if there are other important stakeholders that you feel we should talk to, um, please let us know. Um, because this is on such an accelerated timeline, we're not able to do um, maybe as an extensive and extended period of outreach as other projects have, but we really wanna make sure that we can reach all the groups that we need to. Um, so I'll hand it off to Charlie now, who can talk a little bit about the design elements in this project. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, this is Charlie Ream. I'm the section lead of the planning and project development team at Okta. And you know, generally we coordinate on streetscape projects around town. We work a lot with our measure of KK and U dollars to upgrade streets with repaving. And we're you know happy to be here tonight to talk about how we can leverage this paving project to really you know install a really high quality two way bike facility around Lake Merritt. Um, so just as a paving and kind of a utility coordination project, there there are some guardrails that this project is going to fall under that I guess might be of interest to measure DD and infrastructure. Folks, you know, this will be a curb to curb effort. So, you know, the curb lines around the lake, there are a few small bulb outs like the one you see on the picture in front of you that we'll have to modify, but largely all work for this will um, be between curb to curb. Uh, we're doing limited survey um, grading and some more intensive civil construction around bus boarding islands, but for the most part, these will be, you know, form fit concrete curb in the roadway and a combination of wheel stops and other elements. Um, so you see just a cross section to your left um, at the top is existing conditions on Lakeshore, two travel lanes with one center turning lane. The project as proposed would reduce that center turning lane width and uh, really create just a, a median seven feet wide in the middle of the roadway between two lanes of travel retain parking on both sides with a 12 foot cycle track continuous on the lake side. And that is between El Embarcadero and East 18th Street. Uh, next slide, Jean. Question while you're on this, not on that slide. Sure. So on the, on the lake side, there's no parking of cars at the curb, the car is parked in the middle of the street, right? Yeah, so the parking would be bumped out away from the curb with a two-way cycle track behind it. And then there'll be a buffer space with either concrete islands or wheel stops between the cycle track and those parallel parking spaces. Uh, you And you won't be using those, those ugly white cones in, in this improvement, will you? No, no, I can walk through that in some upcoming slides, but the materials are still being determined, but they will be concrete and not plastic posts. Okay, all right, keep, okay, proceed. Um, okay, yeah, so here are some candidate treatments. Uh, same angle that we were just looking at with the Cleveland Cascade on your left. Uh, you'll see that that bulb out, that sidewalk extension at the crosswalk has been removed. And the parking is now 15 feet off from the lakeside curb. So you have a 12 foot pathway. Um, you see an ADA parking space up ahead, just beyond the crosswalk with a five foot wide um, access aisle to the crosswalk and the curb ramp. We'll be shifting that center island over and slightly narrowing it to make space for the new bike lane and median islands. Um, the bike lane is shown as two colors. Uh, that's because there's actually a six foot concrete gutter pan on Lakeshore Avenue that we'll be improving, um, smoothing out the cracks and you know replacing any potholes there. But we will be leaving that intact as is, as a six foot wide concrete gutter. And then there'll be a six foot wide asphalt um, to finish out the path on the roadside. Um, what else? Oh yeah, could you go to the next slide, Jane? I think it circles the curb stops. Yeah, so we're looking um, right now, um, you know, just really getting started on conceptual design in the last two weeks. A key early question will be how much um, disturbance and excavation we want to be doing on the lake in order to keep this within the bounds of a paving coordination project. So it's a little bit complicated, but there's a state water requirement that I know Terry and some of you may be familiar with that requires stormwater retention 
uh, green infrastructure to be placed wherever you're doing a certain amount of excavation. So we want to, you know, be mindful that this is, you know, a paving coordination project on a fast timeline. So we're going to try to limit the amount of excavation, kind of green infrastructure and utility work that comes along with this project. Is there some um, question will show how left turns are, uh, are provided for? Yeah, sure. So I have a few more slides. Uh, you can go to the next one, Jane. So here are a few shots um, representative blocks and intersections along the street. Uh, on the left is East 18th Street, which is really the southern terminus of the project. Um, due to the constraints of the project, we couldn't alter the signal configuration at East 18th Street. So that double left turn that's coming out of East 18th on the southbound lakeshore needs to stay as is. So that really limits us from extending the two-way cycle track beyond East 18th Street, at least as part of this project. Um, we have an ongoing project that will be entering construction, I think later this year on Lake Merritt Boulevard that ends at First Avenue. So we do know that this will, you know, not fill the gap, you know, about three block gap between International and East 18th, but that's hopefully part of a future project. Um, also on the in diagram on the left, you can see the bus boarding island at East 18th Street southbound. It's an eight foot wide raised six inch high concrete bus boarding island. And then there'll be a raised crosswalk that'll take um, transit patrons to the sidewalk. So a ramp up and a ramp down for bikes. Um, and again, those are some of the more intensive areas of construction that this project will take on. The gray barrier zone, like I mentioned, uh, materials to be determined, but it will definitely be concrete, either some form of precast um, wheel stop um, off the shelf or uh, form, you know, cast in place concrete. Uh, Jane mentioned before, you know, some improvements that we're going to make at intersections that are not on the lakeside. At Hanover, you can see um, using concrete islands to reduce pedestrian exposure to traffic while you're crossing Hanover. And again, those are floating away from the curb to maintain existing drain lines and not, um, you know, not mess with the existing curb lines. Um, at left turn locations like East 18th Street, uh, Hanover Avenue, we're retaining that left turn lane, which I know is an important feature um, for, you know, people heading south on Lakeshore. Uh, next slide. And then just moving farther north, um, just showing that for blocks like this, you know, really not many improvements on the curb at all, but you can see that line of islands separating the new row of parallel parking from the two-way cycle track, also showing that we're going to be fitting in mid-block ADA accessible parking spaces and mid-block curb ramps to improve accessibility at the lake. Uh, next slide. And then here are just a few other representative intersections. Um, on the right is the northern um, section of the project where this project is seeking to remove a section of concrete median that currently exists that would really preclude the two-way cycle track from extending up to El Embarcadero. So that's a key feature of the project. We're going to work um, with our engineers to determine, you know, the specifications. We know that there's some irrigation. Uh, we're already doing some work to investigate the, the needs for capping and relocating that irrigation line. Also on these two images, you'll see some faded gray islands in the center of the street, and that's where we're shifting existing pedestrian safety islands or moving them. Um, what else to highlight here? You know, just left turn um, pockets where they need to be. Uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah, I think that's really it. Um, so just wanted to come here today, walk through the designs. Um, I think there were some questions setting up the agenda, like how this would interfa interface with other Measure DD projects, um, you know, past or future. So happy to, you know, take any questions generally about the project. Uh, the designs or you know input that we can take at this early stage of the project. And if there were some questions in the chat, we can go there as well. Uh, I see a couple questions in the chat, uh, how trash trucks will get to the bike lanes. 
Yeah, we'll be working with uh, environmental services uh, as we work through the project um, on the questions of, you know, waste management access and you know, whether or not the bike lanes would be a drivable space for emergency vehicles and or utility vehicles. I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't and know, yeah. they have street sweepers. Yeah, street sweepers, you know, so we've been in coordination with Public Works on another project, the East Bay Greenway, about potentially providing water spigots for the mini sweeper or other considerations like that. So I think, yeah, we'll be continuing to work through those channels as well. Uh, so I have a few hands up. I'll start with uh, David. Thank you. Well, as uh, many of you know, I ride a bicycle every day and my work is at Lake Merritt. And on Fifth Avenue and Park, uh, that particular route happens to be a place that I go back and forth, back and forth all day. Having said that, I just wanted, I want to, um, and having also just spent 20 years of my life involved in the um, planning for the uh, remodeling of Park Boulevard, uh, this has been a long time coming and I appreciate what has been accomplished so far and what is being put forward and proposed uh, based upon the uh, tremendous amount of use that I have as a bicyclist along that route, as well as everyone else. Thank you, David. Uh, Vince? Hi. Um, thanks. Yeah, I guess I'm um, happy to see all, all of these uh, changes come about here. Let me uh, just put on my, my own video real quick. Uh, I, I leave Hanover whenever I leave my house. Uh, so if you could just, um, you're probably going to do this anyway, but uh, put on the list of things to do to uh, rectify that light. Uh, it, I think the yellow light is too short and uh, uh, people run that, um, run that light all the time. I know they run a lot of traffic lights in Oakland, but that's that's one that's that's really bad. Uh, maybe even put a street camera there. Who knows? Um, I didn't see in the plan, but I'm I'm guessing you have it to um, uh, include a crosswalk to the Cleveland Cascade. Hopefully that's in the works too as a, a bike, but I also run a lot and, and use those stairs. So uh, <laughs> that'd be nice mm -hmm. to have that. Um, and any effort you could make to implement or integrate green infrastructure, uh, you know, has my vote. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a note about the crosswalks. Wherever there's an existing crosswalk today, we'll be maintaining it. Um, same amount of crossings across Lakeshore. Um, for the green infrastructure questions, wanted to clarify that while we might be able to install um, some landscaping, like low landscaping or trees with this project, traditional like rain gardens and engineered green infrastructure would be outside of the scope here. So we are gonna be looking at targeted ways to add some greenery to the lake, but it won't be, um, you know, subsurface water retention, uh, green infrastructure. Uh, sorry, what was the first question that you had? Uh, not a question, just a comment to um, update the, the traffic light, the signal. Oh, at Hanover. At Hanover. It looks like yes, one can... of our first steps with the project is we're going to collect um, traffic counts at all the intersections and take some speed data as well. So we can use that to optimize the signals as part of the project as well. Some okay. of the, the lengths of the turning pockets will be changing and other elements like that. All right. You may have gotten this comment, but as you leave Hanover, it, there's kind of a split traffic can go right or left, and they don't have to wait for the signal to go south on Lakeshore. Um, it looks at, like in your layout, you might lose that with that little buffer there for the crosswalk uh, or lose a parking space. So I know those are trade-offs, but uh, I'm just noticing that from without seeing the, the paint lines, what I think about that intersection over. Um, Myra and Bob. Charlie, um, Bob Redman, I um, wanted to first tell everybody that you've done a great job coordinating on the other side of the lake, the lakeside residents. Um, and I wanted to just let everybody know that Charlie's a guy that look into whatever we're suggesting and try to solve the problem. 
one thing I would like to ask Charlie um, is, are you designing this side of the lake to um, un, un, to underscore the new problem of ATMs, motorcycles, speeding in this area, ATVs? Um, are you considering um, what they call dots or ways to slow down people other than the existing uh, elevated areas that you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've heard this um, comment from a few different areas of the lake and on this project as well. Um, you know, this came up last week as well. One thing that we are gonna be looking at are speed cushions, which are elements in the roadway that are you know, a raised element like a speed hump with wheel channels that allow emergency vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, and buses um, to pass over without having to go up and over. You know, obviously a motorcycle or dirt bike can find the channel as well, but it does require uh, kind of a level of concentration that causes people to slow down. So like I said, we're going to be taking traffic counts at all the intersections and some speed survey. Um, based on that, we're going to do an assessment of whether speed cushions would be warranted and safe. Uh, and then we can start talking about the design of those elements. So it is something we're thinking about. I think also speed control in the bike lane itself is an important element um, and access control. You know, when the, the Lakeside Drive bike lanes were built, uh, you know, there were pretty common occurrences of people driving there and, you know, needed some some ballers and some fixes after the fact. So we're taking lessons learned from there and making sure that the access points are not, you know, available and, um, you know, just trying to design it like to keep vehicles out from day one. Also, Charlie, uh, are we considering the fact that uh, this is an economy that has many, many delivery trucks and many, many residents in that area? Do you think it's being designed sufficiently to handle that kind of situation for many years? I mean, luckily, you know, the lakeside has no destinations for delivery drivers. You know, the center turn lane being removed or narrowed to a median width, you know, will definitely make it harder, you know, make it impossible for people to park and load from the middle lane, which I do see from time to time. So, you know, it's a conversation about potentially adding more white zones or, um, you know, open curb spaces on the, the south side of Lake Shore. And that's something that we're also going to be looking at as well. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And good to All see right. you again, Bob. And thanks for your positive comments, David, as well. Uh, last question from Jane. Uh, I noticed in the presentation you mentioned the Lake Merritt Working Group, a work group. Uh, why? Uh, this. Not about four questions, so you might just want to take a couple notes. Uh, the first question is why uh, was Measure D not uh, contacted to be part of the uh, work group? Uh, two, uh, question about uh, the whether there's going to be additional greenery or landscaping, and if so, uh, what are the proposals or plans for maintaining that. Uh, the third question is, uh, Lake Merritt Boulevard has bike lanes on either side of the street, on, on the, to the curbside. Uh, not the curbside, but to the parking lane side. And uh, there are questions I'm not clear about how the transition is being made from Bicycles going both ways on the water side. Uh, after you get to East 18th, how does that transition get made so that the bike uh, and the bicycles that are coming from downtown uh, don't come across traffic to get into the two-way uh, cycle track that you're designing? And the second, the last question, I wasn't too clear about how vehicles make the left turns off of Lakeshore onto Hanover and 
and the couple other streets that happened. Uh, and without without you don't have to go back to graphics, but I'd like you just to say how that how that happens. Thank you. James, I can answer your first question about the Lake Merritt Working Group. Um, that working group is primarily attended by uh, staff within the city of Oakland. Um, we have actually not attended before, so this would be our first time attending that meeting um, in order to get uh, so that other teams within the city can look at this project. And also we have another project on Lakeside Drive and Lake Merritt Boulevard. Um, okay, thanks. Unless that's why, yeah. Um, Charlie, do you mind uh, explaining a little bit more about the landscaping possibilities? As well as James. Yeah, sure. I think the, the question was generally, uh, how does the city plan to maintain landscaping that we put in? Um, it was just a great question. So, you know, with any decision to put landscaping around the lake with this project, we would need to have a conversation with our partners at Public Works, um, you know, neighborhood stewardship programs. We look at, you know, tree establishment periods, possible contracting and any other avenues that we could take to, you know, make sure that landscaping is successful. Um, and, you know, we are prepared to scale back on landscaping with this project as needed um, as those conversations develop. Um, the transfer of the two-way to the one-way at East 18th Street and at Ellen Barcadero will be accomplished with bikes traveling adjacent to the crosswalks um, with the existing signal phases at those intersections. Uh, a little bit farther down on Lake Merritt Boulevard, starting at, I believe at East 12th, there'll be a two-way lakeside path, bike path that'll be installed by that project that'll be starting later this year or early next. So I think, you know, the goal with that segment of First Avenue um, is to you know someday plan for a connection of that two-way pathway around the lake. Uh, and then how to turn left if you're heading southbound um, or you know toward East 18th, uh, any left turn lanes, so into Hanover um, on the East 18th, those will be maintained with this project. So you'll still be able to go into a left turn lane and turn left. Thank you. Adrian, I want to clarify on this response to James's third question. Okay, um, I think we're well over time at this point. Um, I can I could go out and find out myself, but I'm curious as to where the two lanes on Lake Merritt Boulevard headed west would end exactly. I'm mean, sorry, headed east. You see, headed east, coming around the lake, and then going to mm -hmm. go down Lake Shore. Where would that end? I believe Lake Merritt Boulevard. Or, or sorry, East 12th Street is where that project ends. I would need to double check those plans. There's a two-way pathway around the lake. Yeah, that goes to Lake Merrick Bull or East 12th Street. And then there's another segment that goes up one more block to International Boulevard on First Avenue. So it would probably end on International and First, if you except for that small disjointing. Exactly, yeah. And if, if you want to email me or you know continue this offline, I'm, I'm happy to put a the website for that project in the chat and the plans are posted there as well. Okay, great, thank you. Is your email in the uh, chat? Yeah, sure thing. Great, uh, thank you, Charlie and Jane for your time and presentation. Yeah, and if we have, uh, you can get the website for any follow-up, that would be great. Uh, you're welcome to hang out for the rest of the meeting if you care to, um, but appreciate your time. And otherwise I will hand it over to Terry. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen.
Right. So, <clears throat> hello, I'm Terry Fashing, Acting Watershed and Stormwater Management Division, uh, manager for the <laughs> Acting Manager for Watershed and Stormwater Management Division and Acting DD Program Manager. Um, my regular position is Watershed Program Supervisor. Uh, whoops. Um, we also have Lita Buena Flores doesn't attend these meetings, but she assists with some fiscal work. We have Stephen Acker here. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for being here. Are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, thank you for being here. And also, we do have our Director of Public Works, G. Harold Duffy, and thank you, Harold, for being here. Um, uh, this just summarizes, in addition, other folks who are involved with helping us administer Measure DD. Um, we have Hazel Tesoro with o OPRF, uh, who helps uh, facilitate meetings. Thank you so much. Um, Mike Perlmutter helps me kind of manage some of the administrative work and um, collaborates with Hazel on responding to public inquiries. Um, Hazel, Adrian, Mike help out with the website. So thanks everybody. Um, so I thought I would put, given our earlier discussion, I thought I would put Estuary Park first. Um, so it's a little out of order. I, you know, the project manager is completing, she has completed 90% uh, design documentation. So 90% designs are complete um, and the draft CEQA environmental impact report addendum is complete. However, as was mentioned earlier, there is a bit of a pause because it is true that um, the developer is exploring placing housing um, uh, on parcel N. And there is an online article about this that was referred to in the Measure DD meeting agenda. And I pulled the little map that is shown in that article to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. So if it, if it were to happen that housing would be placed in parcel N, then Estuary Park Project would uh, be a little bit smaller. However, as um, as how or as Director Duffy pointed out, um, I want to talk to you. Sorry, I'm going to have a moment here trying to deal with this screen situation. Uh, here we go. Um, so I wanted to pull up this map of Estuary Park to kind of show this. So this is parcel N, which is um, would would be taken over by the city and a and the, you know we've been envisioning the park going there. Whoopsie! I'm sorry. I'm having computer driving problems. Uh, so in our plan, in our conceptual master plan for the park, uh, inside this red outlined area. We were proposing to and have 90% designs for a park in this area. Um, the the fact that the developer is wanting to talk to the city about adding housing um, means that we are, as Harold said, strategizing, thinking about what would happen if housing did go in this location. And um, we have been directed to pause, you know, implementing this project as it is designed. We, we have not canceled it, but we are just pausing and taking a minute to think about how we would phase this project while we're waiting for this, you know, these new developments to, we need more information based on 
the developers uh, plan to speak with the city about their proposal. And so therefore we are looking at options for phasing um, uh, our work. And so I do not, we're at the beginning of this. So this is new for us and we are, I do not know right now what that is gonna look like. I will tell you that the project manager, Chris Reed is working on this, thinking about it and uh, same, this is a conversation in planning and building as well. And I, sorry, having problems here. Okay, so, but I wanted to say that, oh no, let me go back to this. So in, when we did public outreach, and this has been pointed out by your team here, the folks who have been involved with the Estuary Park Project, um, the public uh, feedback that we got um, at, at the public, meeting, online survey and community meeting number four, we received um, a lot of interest in the Bay Trail throughout the whole improvements to the Bay Trail throughout the park um, and resilient shoreline improvements. That was a high priority and um, waterfront activities, waterfront picnic area, so on and so forth. So I'm it is very complicated, as Chris Reed has pointed out to you all in the past. Hold on, let me get this back up here. That little Zoom thing is in my way. Um, it is that this entire park has been designed based on excluding, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna move this over here and this over here. Okay, so this, this park right here has been designed, but we, we were not planning to do actual work in this little triangle of the park because it is very complex technically. And um, we are, due to sea level rise, we are planning to raise different areas of our proposed project inside this red uh, outline. Um, over in this area inside this blue outline, the proposed project was going to do some paving changes and some striping changes. But other than that, inside this blue area, we were not proposing to do work. And, and that is for some very good technical reasons. As we look into phasing our project, we are looking over in this area to see what could be done if indeed uh, if indeed housing were to be added here and it is you know i am not i am just saying that i have like this isn't this has not been decided i am just saying that we are thinking about different things and you know ultimately we have our series d funding uh, which, because we've been asked to pause, I am thinking about how we would be spending our Series D funding in the future. So I'm trying to expand my mind a little bit and think about what could be possible. So that is really the extent of what Harold and I, that Harold thought that I might mention to you is that simply that one, we're looking at phasing the Estuary Park project while we because, because the other really important thing is that we need to spend the Series C funding soon. And so we do not want uh, the project to pause for very long, the construction of the project. So we are actively looking at how we can phase things. We are thinking about the future of Series D, if indeed the, the park were just theoretically, if the park were to be smaller and contained in on city property as city property exists right now, then, um, you know, it may be that we have more money to spend 
over on this other side of the park where we weren't, as I was showing you, we weren't planning to do anything over here. But again, as I said, and as Chris Reed has said to you, it's complicated to, and our whole design over here is, is based on interfacing with a part of the park that is that we're not planning to raise. So it, let me just not go any further and see if you have any questions. And I'm really letting you know that I don't have that much information. We are just at the beginning and we're just starting to realize that we need to um, think about this, right? So I will stop talking now. Go ahead, Harold. Or I'm not sure who was first. Maybe yeah. someone kept track. Terry, could you put the, the, the graph of the property back up there in parcel D? That is fine. Mm -hmm. So I just okay. want to be I just want to be clear. So I am <laughs> three, two, twelve, twenty-two, and four. That looks like that's in parcel D. Right. Parcel N, I'm sorry. Parcel oh, N. Parcel N sixteen, twenty-two, twenty-two. I would say um it it helps me to look at this. Right. So that's fine. So this one is fine. So my point that I'm trying to I wanted to make is that the project requires the developer to clean and clear that property. Is that correct, Terry? The the project requires the developer to remediate um yeah, this right. parcel. Right. The, and the, and the developer is not able to remediate that property to meet our time frame. And what Terry also indicated, and that's why Stevens here also, is that the project has resources, these the bonds, but the bond money has an expiration date. And so significant delays will limit our ability to use those bond funds. So Terry's gonna move forward with phasing the project to ensure that we can use as much money as possible. But with the developer not being able to remediate the property, we're not gonna be able to go in and clear that particular site. Now, the question is, I know it's I'm gonna say this, well, if the developer's not ready to remediate that site, how are they proposing to put housing? And I do want to clarify, I'm unaware of any number of products that he wants to put on the, on the site. The number 600 and some odd seems like it's a huge number. I do know the product is for sale market rate, and it's not a high rise facility, but that, that's all up in the air. But the thing is, I know the developer is not able already at this point in time to remediate that property. So our 90% plan really can't be implemented. And that's why Terry's looking at different strategies. And we wanted to kind of bring all this information to the Measure DD committee. Thank you, Harold. Yeah. I have questions from James, Bill, and then uh, John Klein. Go ahead, James. Mute. Uh, yeah. The the approved development plan for for Brooklyn Basin requires thirty acres of parks, and that and within that thirty acres is all of uh, Estuary Park as we see it uh, displayed on screen now. The, uh, the developer cannot. Uh, without a plan change, there cannot be any swap of land or any taking of land by the developer. Also, the approved uh, development plan has a timetable. So there is a timetable for the developer to have remediated this property, uh, put it of toxins and so forth. And if the developer has not acted in accord with the with the schedule and the approved development plan, then the developer can be sued uh, to uh, to perform as is required on the development agreement. Uh, I think that 
phasing the project, okay, I understand that, but we have to have a, a definite line in the sand on housing, fronting where uh, where this park is to go. That would be an invisible park if 600 units are put in front of it between that and the Embarcadero. This was never intended to be uh, residential. And if, uh, if any moves are made at this time to make that residential, there's gonna be a tremendous fight at, uh, uh, all the way up to city council. The, uh, so I think we actually do need the work group to, to uh, get to the bottom of this and to get a, a position that is recommended to the Majority Coalition and the coalition takes action on it so that we were gonna have a firm position uh, before city council on this proposal by the developer. I think it's a hideous proposal that he's making. And I don't think we should be bow bowing down or bending to the developer at this point. This is, this is to be a park. This is to be a public park. There is no park uh, uh, of this uh, size of magnitude or that serves this need that this park serves. So I think that, uh, I think we should continue with the plan as as has been developed and so far as has had Measure DD's approval up to now. And I think that we should continue forward. Thanks. Gary, is there a, is there a park? Uh nearby here is um union point park nearby yes uh not not very near it's uh, about a mile a mile and a half away i only mention that because i believe that park is somewhat isolated and you can experience the, all of the issues that we have faced with that park being so isolated so it is important that we have a park that is actively engaged uh, as, as part of the process. But I, I would just say, I agree with you. You should make sure that you have your committee together and that you find out what's going on. But I would certainly recommend that you not, first you find out what the proposal is. I do not believe it is 600 and some odd homes. I think that is a number that is grossly exaggerated. Uh, I have not heard anywhere near that. I haven't heard anything, but, but I, I know you can't put 600 market rate housing on that. It's not a high rise product. But you uh, should absolutely go and move forward with getting all the information. I certainly agree with you, sir. Thank you. Uh, John Klein? John, you still there? Yes, I'm still here. I'm just uh, scrolling around. So first of all, I would like to agree with everything that James Van just said. Um, if any kind of housing project goes there, it will just, you'll have a invisible park. It will be, it will just disappear. But really right now, this was not something that, I, this is a concern that's coming up with me right now. And that is that it seems uh, that, that this, that the estuary park development was put on pause, on hold, and it was not communicated publicly to the DD coalition. I have real concerns about that. We have two city staffers here that seem to be pretty much in the loop about this the pause, why there's a pause, the um, the um, the, the elements of what is going to be proposed what, other than the actual number of units. I have some real concerns about the transparency on this. And to me, that is, tells me we need to proceed with finding out more. So I agree with that. The project developer is having issues delivering parks generally. They have an agree to, deli agree to deliverables on the parks of the other areas and, they're, and they've stopped developing the parks that are already in the other phases that they, they have stopped building there they've paused construction on new um, housing buildings they've paused the construction on gateway park which is their next deliverable that is due to be delivered and complete gateway park a year from now and they're not even working on it and that's going to push all the other parts much 
there's a timeline that's in in the uh, development agreement. So they're um, having some issues there. They're just having some general issues at at that site. So uh, again, coming back to Estuary Park, it's just unconscionable to me that um, we've got uh, people who are part of DD, uh, staffers are part of DD, that are asking us to think about modifying the uh, estuary park to a much reduced park than what years of, of effort and planning have gone into. I'm, I'm just dumbfounded by that. Well, so, sure. I, I don't believe that Terry in any way, shape or form recommended that you modify the park. Terry came here tonight to explain to you what she is aware of based upon what we learned. Well, oh, okay, but I'm wondering, excuse me, but I'm wondering, uh, I mean, I think it was James Van that put this on the agenda. So I'm wondering if had we not done this, would we have heard about this? I mean, we haven't heard about this at all, other than there was an article in a in a trade magazine and it pushed it out to at, at inquired with um, one of the planners and he said, yes. And then 600 units is the number that's being tossed around. Okay, so that just means six floors. Yeah, I, 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 I can't get into that, but that's a number that's out there. If it's if it's exaggerated, somebody else exaggerated, wow. that's the number we're going on. Yeah, and once again, sir, uh, as to transparency, it appears that you might know more than me because <laughs> I have never heard that number before. Um, what happened is we presented the project to the city administrator. Which project? Uh, an update on the plan, the 90% plan, and said, we are ready to move forward. And that was the goal. That's why we're at 90%. And so what's happening is we have been asked to pause in order to, to figure out what's going on. Our, our issue really is we want to make sure that we maximize the Measure DD funds. That is why Terry's here tonight in terms of transparency. She has been a strong advocate along with Christine to ensure that the Measure DD Coalition is uh, up to date on this particular issue. That's why you're at 90% design right now. Okay. All right. Sure. Thank you. Right. Right. And we we don't want to pause <laughs> because we would like to spend our series C funding and so we are we are looking at what can we do with the current design now and i'm simply you know hopefully anyway i am just saying you know yeah, Terry, you're, you're trying to move things along yeah, so I think, very, I think it's very important that we make it real clear is that we support the Measure DD Coalition. And whatever you decide to do, we will support you and provide you information on that. But okay. what we want to do is give you what we have mm -hmm. so you can make an informed decision as you move forward. That's the extent. We are not an advocate of the, of the change of the project. We are an advocate of maximizing the use of Measure DD funds. Right. Okay. Mr. Duffy, just as information, Yes, the developer did request to increase the size of the project by 600 units from 3,100 to 3,700. And he did get city of council approval of that number. So that is the number that he is now authorized to, to add to the 3,100 original units. And he, he got that to add it to, to parcel N? There was no parcel N before. He's uh, come up with that because the project parcels in that M. So in he came up with, the developer came up with that number, that letter. letter. But I, I think this is all the more reason why we do need a working group to, to meet and and uh, meet with staff and, and with city, city uh, administrator, get to the bottom of this and so that we can get a decision on this so that we can move ahead. Agreed. Uh, uh, I, uh, well, there's two hands that have been raised for a while. I just want to make sure. All right. 
they get a chance to speak, uh, David and then Bill. Thanks. Um, it is rather complicated and not to belabor any points, but uh, it was just a couple of hopefully quick questions that I had. I'm not uh, reserve. I am reserving, uh, you know, like a position on this. But uh, I was curious as to uh, does the remediation that the company is either required to do or looking at doing include the blue area? I want to get all of these points out, and then um, so that's what I'm asking: is does the remediation that the company is required to do include the blue area automatically? And then um, the bond date, well, we're, we're, we're discussing the questions that have come up. Did they come up because th this developer has made a proposal or because there's a bond date and we're going to lose the money if we don't uh, take action? What is the distinction there in terms of why we're having this question? Uh, I haven't gotten clear. When you we talk about 600 units so far, but and then there's a 300-acre uh for parts so i'm not clear on how much acreage the three the 600 units would be taken up given the number of acreages that we have been thinking about up until now if you can speak to that easily i um, think that's 30 acres of parks what did i say i meant to say 30. yeah it's this the entire project is about 62 acres so 30 acres of parks yeah well but the simple question is of the acreage that we're looking at for parks, how much would uh, this parcel in <laughs> take up in terms of acreage? I, I hear that it's 600 units. Um, so I'm curious about that. And then I think that, um, well, that that's it, except philosophically to say, changes in economic conditions were mentioned, which I think we should take into consideration. I just would, and this doesn't have to be answered tonight, but I just wasn't clear on why any changes in economic <clears throat> conditions would have to uh, be to our demise as opposed to our benefit. Why couldn't we end up with more park space as a result? Anyway, that's a side thought. I'll stick with my earlier questions, which are, if I need to repeat them. Please. Does the remediation include the blue area that the uh, developer is required to do? And what is the specific uh, acreage that will be taken up by the potential 600 units? The developer is 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 obligated under his development agreement to remediate the site where the commercial use was originally uh, situated, uh, which fronted on Embarcadero. Uh, I have to go back and review the development agreement, see if that included the entire park area. But the area the developer is showing as a new parcel in that he would like to take away, um, my top of head estimate is that that's about eight acres, a large part of what we are guaranteed, supposed to be guaranteed to have as parkland. Thank you, James. That goes to the acreage. My question regarding the blue area, when I say blue area, I'm referring referring to the area that was identified as blue that runs down to the waterfront where they have these docks and things of that. And I'm curious as to whether or not, whether the parcel or units go forward, the developers required to make any remediation already in that area. That I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that. No. I know the area that fronts on Embarcadero is definitely where the building was demolished. He's definitely contracted to remediate that area to clear it of toxins. Whether he was to do that for the existing area of Estuary Park. I'll have to go back to the development agreement to check on that. But So Terry, go go to back to your slide, Terry, where you show the the development and the red line for the area that's included. Yeah. Okay. So he's asking was there going to be some improvements in, in section 14, 13, 22, 19, the, all that area. That's in the blue yeah. area. That's that's There's the question. Yeah. Right. There's no remediation being done here. And the only thing we were planning to do as part of the project is some paving and striping, maybe just striping. I have to look back at the plans in this little area. 
So inside the blue area, all we're doing is some some surface changes to this parking lot. And Gary, that that bike lane that's there is that in jeopardy? Uh, no. This bike lane right now, th this is an existing bike lane that we were not planning to change. And um, this, this lane that goes through here, this would change as a result of the project. And that is on city property. Okay. So Terry, in the blue area that he's referencing, are you saying that that, that bike lane is not in future jeopardy? There's, there's based no on there's based no sea on, rise level or anything with that. Oh, oh, yeah. See, yes, yeah, sea level rise. Um, so if we wanted to develop this part, we would have to raise it because it is projected to be impacted by sea level rise, is my understanding. Okay, to be clear, that has to be take place for its current use, uh, because of sea level rise. So I think that's already on the table. That's not in the project. Oh, really? That's not in the project. Okay. And that's And that's the only reason why I had Terry put it here, because she said there was a focus on that, but that was not in the project. And so when this happened, I said, look, you might want to consider letting the DD committee know that that's, that, that has some, I mean, whether sea level rise is going to happen or not, that is, if it happens, that that that's there's some jeopardy there for that particular area. So I wanted to point that out. Director Duffy, did I hear you understand you to say earlier a reference to the fact that if uh, 600 units went forward, no. that would somehow enable a, a process? You've never heard me say anything about mediation could occur. Units. Okay, you've never heard me say anything about 600 units. Well, if if the, if the developer's proposal. Uh, I, I've forward. never heard that. I don't believe it's an accurate representation. I, earlier, I heard you referring to that blue area and saying something that I thought to the effect that if uh, a, a, a proposal of some sort from the developer went forward, it would allow for access to funds and, and also a, a movement of funds to uh, impact the blue area. So what, what I said, what I, what I think what I said and what Terry was conveying is that if you have to redesign the project and you lose that that in area, you would then have additional resources to consider yeah. that area, along with because you you also had two other projects that you've had to modify because of you couldn't get access because of because of industrial area and you had a marine issue. For, un for underground bike lane or something like that. So those projects are on hold. So it's about trying to find a way to maximize the use of those, of those projects. Thanks for the clarifications. And just, Bill, you want oh, I just wanted to show everyone this, this is the parcel map, just so we're clear. This, I think this is, this is the privately owned parcel and this is the city owned parcel just so you can see the size of parcel in that we're talking about. Um, just, it, it's helpful to me to look at it this way, so. Um. Yes, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Adrian. We've already spent a lot of Measure DD money developing a plan for Estuary Park. And that plan was conditioned on the understanding that parcel in lands would be available. That understanding was based on some documents, some agreements. It might be the development agreement. It might be amendments to the development agreement. It might be other documents. I think in, in trying to decide how to respond to this, we need to know what are the governing documents that determine the disposition of parcel N. Without that knowledge, we're just saying, well, we think this is what's required, or someone else seems to think something else is required. Clearly, uh, staff thought parcel N was available for Estuary Park. 
But if in fact it is not going to be available based on the initiative that's being considered by the developer, then we need to know that and we need to understand what are the conditions that govern its disposition. And sir, I would recommend that your group that you establish work with the planning and, 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 and development group at the city so they can give you exactly the documentation what the development agreement is. I think that's that's a very smart move on your Would mind. you name the contact at the planning and development group that you're speaking about? Um, we can get that, Bill. We can get that for you, absolutely. All right. Uh, William, yeah. uh, William, will you will you be willing to uh, work on the be part of the working group? Uh, <clears throat> let's see how this e evolves. Okay, okay, you're indispensable in this discussion. Thank you. Okay, so should we move on? So, uh, I just want to say one other thing because. I've done a number of developments throughout my 30 year career. And you're absolutely right. There is a development agreement that binds the developer to do A, B, and C for as a part of the entitlement process. And it's very important that the coalition um, understand what that what that is and see if it's binding or if it's flexible, but uh, you know, there is, a, I believe, a specific plan associated with this. So it is important to understand that part was arrived at as a compromise to the overall development. So it really isn't that easy to really undo. There would have to be some cooperation with the city and you'd have to, when I, what I would always say in the development process is, if you're gonna make a change, make sure that you get what you need out of the project. So you're right, the developer just can't make an arbitrary change and you have to sit down and take it. But what you need to do is consider all the factors and ensure that you get a product that the city can be proud of. Um, and also too, you can fight the good fight and end up with nothing. Or you can fight the good fight and end up with a product that you can really live with. And so I would ask you to consider that as you move forward in this process, it's very important that you get all the information and you understand the position that you're in and also the amount of money that you've already spent on getting to 90% design. You should not lose those resources. And that should be the cornerstone of anything that you do is to protect the money that you've already put into the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, I, is it okay for us to move on to the next, uh, through the process, through the presentation? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is really quick. I was asked to do some research about doing in-person meetings at the garden center. And I found out that it would cost about $446 per meeting. Um, I did not see if that, Cost could be shared with another group. I just got the basic information that indeed this is the cost. Set up and tear down is 155. I think that can be done by people who attend the meeting. But in any case, that's that. And I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. I'm just reporting out. Um, also, I talked with East Bay Regional Park District. I didn't get any updates on their projects. So when I put, upload this report to the website, I'll, it's just they're, they are, they haven't made progress on these projects. That's the update. Um, so I got can, it. Can I just chime in just for a second as you go back to it? Is it the desire of the Measure DD group to have a place to meet together? Is that the desire? There were uh, there was an arrangement that we had for meeting before. If in fact we want to go back to the garden center where we didn't pay anything, we piggybacked on the uh, I guess uh, I don't know what's the uh, orchid society or whoever 
Yeah. But uh, before we make any decisions on that, I think we ought to look and see if it's possible to resurrect the the arrangement we had before, which uh, which costs nothing. Yeah, um, and so uh, my, my point is the reason why I'm interjecting here as the public works director, where I have citizens who are volunteering their time to provide guidance for us on the important items, is that you should be meeting at a city facility with no charge as you uh, are moving forward in this process. So I'll work with Terry on this, because this is just not something that we should be having a conversation about, about a fee for you to do the work of the city. It's unacceptable. Well, right, and Harold, the, my assumption is that we would have to use Measure DD administrative funds for this, um, but if we can get it at no charge, that would be great. So I will talk to you about that. I yeah, will follow absolutely. up. Great, Absolutely. thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so and moving on. Right, right, Kent, before we move on, yeah. uh, as as long as Mr. Duffy is offering us something, what we would really like is a place where we can have hybrid meetings where it, we could meet in person, but also by Zoom. So we can do that at City Hall. And we did find out that we can reserve um, one of those hearing rooms and those work pretty well there. Mike did the research that is free. Um, and I was directed by the DD coalition to look into the garden center, but we can meet at city hall if, if that is desired. And those that works pretty well for hybrid meetings. And it's a little more complicated at the garden center is my understanding based on, you know, so. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we look at the options to bring those options back to the back to your committee? Okay. Or at least to, to, to your chairman. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I also wanted to say that, oops, this is, let me just share. The, um, so I was asked, there's the repair of the decomposed granite um, path around Lake Merritt. This is, um, you know, this path was originally a DD project and, and it ha it needs repair. And so our facilities group is working on this project. They have had, as you know, some contracting issues, but the project manager is making, uh, sorry for my typo, he continues to work on this project and is making progress. Um, the most degraded parts of the path will be prioritized prioritized, they have $300,000 in Measure Q funding, and the budget will not fund the initial $660,000 quote. Um, I was asked to check into whether using lightweight concrete would be a good approach, and I checked with the project manager, Craig Pond, and he said that in order to use that lightweight concrete, we would have to do demolition to the base material, um, we would have to hire an on-call contractor instead of hiring a vendor who we're hiring to to repair the 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 current path, and we would we would not know until we did it what condition we would find the base in, and we would not know if we needed to also do some improvements to the base. So it would it would actually probably make the project more expensive if we used lightweight concrete. So he did not want to pursue that. And then there was a, the a request to do a long-term plan for um, for the pathways around the park. And um, I will make that recommendation to the CIP program for, you know, in the upcoming CIP process, but we do not have a long-term plan at this time. Okay. So um, Terry, let me let me just add here to this point is yeah. So right now there is twenty two million dollars in Measure Q fund balance, and everybody's scrambling to try to figure out what they can do or utilize that twenty two million dollars. This bike repair path is qualifies for that, and yeah. so what I would recommend that. Um, at your next meeting with your Measure DD group, that your group put on the agenda and that you fully support requesting that the city council allocate some of that Measure Q fund balance to allow you to 
repair this path at the original estimated cost. And I'm, I, I'm not sure it was a whole path. Or not. I live in, I live uh, at Lakeside and I think some of your participants know me and I walk that path. I'm, I know exactly what you're talking about and it's very dangerous. And one of the things that the city is aware of is that you pay now or you pay later. Trip and fall accidents are significant. And so if we can repair that path sooner rather than later, it's very important to, to do that. But I would recommend that you guys, with that Terry, you work with the Darren, get a, get the estimated quote, and then you bring that number back to your DD advisory committee, and they take a vote on it, and you ship that back off to in time for the budget process. I'm sure Council President Bass or Council Member Fife would love to carry this action for for you guys. And Harold, I this was not the update that I got from Craig when I asked for it for this, but you're reminding me. I think we did. We are there is a proposal in to to use some of that Measure Q fund balance, yeah. and I forgot to come and update this. So I think that. I, I will check on that. So I'll check on that with Rena and Darren yeah. and, and see where we are and then come back to the group. Great. But thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, okay, moving on. I'm going to just move the, through this quickly. We're no updates on the Lakeside Green Street project. We're still continuing to do some irrigation post-construction work. Um, moving on to funding category three, Lake Merritt to Estuary. This is why Rebecca Dar is here. I don't even know if she's still here. Um, I, I w I'm going to go through this pretty fast, Rebecca, and I will, I will let you weigh in. Um, just or do you want? In the interest of time, where are we time wise? Uh, Eight fifty four. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go through this. Really this is quickly. pretty significant. So if you can let Rebecca, that okay. would be great. This is pretty Rebecca, significant. Rebecca, go for it. And I want to tell you, Rebecca, I added some uh, cost slides at the end of this. So I added to your slides. So go ahead and go through your presentation, and then I'll chime in when we get to the cost slides. So just tell me when to proceed. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, so. As you're, you're well aware of the challenges that have been facing Peralta Park and the work that's needed to be performed by the city to complete the mitigation requirements under the permits that we have with the uh, San Francisco Regional Bay, San Francisco, San Francisco Regional Water Quality Control Board and the uh, California Fish and Wildlife Department. We have managed to secure final approval from the Army Corps uh, just, just recently at the end of January. And the challenges that we face with the uh, Water Quality Control Board and California Fish and Wildlife is that the state of California is now requiring 10 years of monitoring and reporting on any replanting and compliance along those levels to meet the permit requirements by restoring the plants that have died or been destroyed due to vandalism. And that 10 year threshold is ex extremely difficult in this highly, highly urbanized situation. So what we're looking at is a proposed full enclosure of the by an exterior fence around the entire park to prevent uh, just free access into this site. And the fence itself would be the same kind of fence that I put in in the spring of 2022, February, March, uh, to protect the wetlands, specifically the wetlands as a high resource center. So the fencing would start on the Lake Merritt. If we start at the south, the Lake Merritt Boulevard bridge and wrap around through the adjacent to the Kaiser 
convention center parking lot and then travel along the sidewalk edge up onto the 10th Street Bridge. There would be four gates involved, a gate on 10th Street to the south, a gate on the Kaiser Convention Center, which is already a main access point. And then if you go to the next slide, Terry. Oh. Did, did you want to say something about that? Sorry, I didn't know that was there. About PRAC. Uh, we'll come back to that. So, so, OK, <laughs> I, I can throw it, throw, throw it in. That the I went before PRAC because I'm being required to get a uh, conditional use permit for this fence and went before the board uh, PRAC Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee hearing on the 13th to present this fence enclosure of the entire park, which will also affect the hours in which this park is operational and we received unanimous recommendation for this proposed fencing plan of the site to prevent trespassing at night, to prevent future vandalism. And uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. This is the next slide. Well, so this is the fence that's in there now and that that's the same style that we would use as the exterior. Uh, I know Adrian saw where this fence got vandalized recently, and that was quickly repaired by, by facilities, Oakland facilities, o OPW facilities. And part, part of the ease in vandalizing this fence has been the intense um, lack of public use, availability for public use due to the heavy homeless encampments in here and the sense of lack of public safety and the ability to for the public to use this multi-use trail. So there will be four gates. I showed you two of them and they are planned to be open during the day and locked at night. Let's go to the next slide. And here is what I'm calling the Lake Merritt Gate. So you can see up, you can see towards the top of this image where the fence is on the Lake Merritt Boulevard. But we would be gating on the north side of the Lake M Boulevard bridge overpasses with a double gate that would be locked at night. And these, the bright, uh, turquoise colors are where signage is placed, and uh, you'll see a slide of the signage. So in elevation on the right-hand side of this slide, this would be uh, eight foot high, double swing, steel picket gate that is locked at night and open during the day. <clears throat> Next slide. And the other, the fourth gate is to the south, very south part of the Laney College area. And again, it would be to prevent encampments and blockages beneath the bridge overhang and structures. So the eight foot high steel picket fence with signage would be locked at night and open during the day. And uh, so that passage would be continuous from Lake Merritt all the way down south through past Laney College dur during the day. This is the uh, proposed signage language that would also have two other columns adjacent to the English, one in Spanish and one in Cantonese. And right now, the hours proposed are in the summer hours to be 8.30 to 6.30. PRAC suggested that it be stay open later until 7.30 or 8. And we're totally flexible for that. I just 
wanted to be sure that the gates got locked prior prior to it just being uh you know really twilight hours where it's hard to see if people are spending the night because the intention is for a security service to make a sweep of the park in the evenings to make sure that no one is staying inside the park uh, overnight. And that is the purpose of these evening hours settings. The language that you see below, the no trespassing, lodging, are all items that allow OPD, Oakland po Police Department, to come in if the security suite, there are people who refuse to leave, it allows the police service, to, the police to come in and to uh, remove, remove people prior to locking of the gates at night. Next slide. So here's where I added some stuff, um, some language, uh, Rebecca. <laughs> so you want to do the first part and and then I can talk about the funding. Sure. So uh, we're looking at, so the fabrication of the fence is a lengthy process, but we're out to bid right now for the uh, fencing contract and hope to start the physical installation of the fencing in the early summer or maybe as late as July, so midsummer. And we will be working closely with the encampment management teams of the city to coordinate closing of the, the current encampments that we have in the park with our ability to then lock this site to secure it against uh, future future trespassing and efforts that can happen at night. Once the site is secured, I can then totally repair the irrigation and do all of the planting that's required to close out these permits. And it is uh, my fervent, all my efforts are to getting these contracts in place, getting the fence up, the ability to secure the site for the safety of the public, the safety of all of city staff who are working there and our construction contractors, and to have all work, all construction work completed this year by mid-December at the latest of 2024. And so, um, Rebecca, the total cost of all work would be 2.7 million, and that would be because, will you explain a little bit why? Because the the so that I that line item, it, yeah. you know. So, I'm I'm sorry to say, Terry, these slides have been, have been changed. <laughs> since I since I worked on them for this presentation, and so I didn't have time to go back and see what you guys have done. The estimated total cost of all work should be removed. Okay. Because right. this group this group is only dealing with Measure DDD funds, right. and that's what you're showing is what we're how we're intending to use the measure DD funds. And that is the one point, close to 1.5 million. Right. And that's what I wanted to say is so the, and your current project has about 535,000 in the existing budget right now. Um, mm -hmm. and we have about 984,000 in this funding category in remaining series C funds and Stephen, Acker, I want to let you know this too. And we would like to use this funding um, to, so we have a little bit more than we need, or we have about what we need, a little bit more. We need one point, almost 1.5 million, and that's about what we have. It's 1.5 million. And um, so these are remaining funds from projects that 
are have have been completed and they have remaining funds or projects that are not going to be built, such as, as the Seventh Street um, uh, project to to do something different with the pump station there. And um, so my proposal is that we use these remaining funds from Series C to fund this project because we have to complete this project. And you all asked me to try to say what can't be done as uh, uh, if we spend this nearly $1 million on, on this project. And right now, what wouldn't be done is um, the wish list projects, but what I, the, and these are all of the wish list projects that you all have told me about that have had, you know, preliminary cost estimates attached to them when I added these to the CIP, um, just so that they would be on that list. Um, the parks OPRYD put, put cost to these and, um, so these are the wish list projects. Um, and, you know, they total, and there could be some questions about these cost estimates and those could be discussed in the future, but um, we are showing about 24 million here. And then you can see that there are smaller projects such as like this East 18th Street Pier. Oops, wrong. Did I a different did, category. Sorry, I did the wrong category. Sorry. Ooh, yeah. this was a mistake. I have I have this. Yep, that is the wrong category. I apologize. I moved the wrong slide. Um <sighs> sorry about that. Here here it is. Um here's the Lake Merits, the category three wish list uh wish list a uh, list here so we have these projects are proposed by you all and um this is what you know the little bit of series d funding could go towards seed funding for these projects but we really do need to i'm just going to get back to my point that i'm making which is we we propose to spend the remaining Series C funding, because we, for one thing, we need to spend that funding quickly. For another thing, um, we must complete this project. We must get out of these uh, permit requirements. So James and David have comments. I'm not sure who's first. Uh, James is first. Well, my comment was referring to something that was some time back and that was uh if uh, the uh, estimates for doing the gate work the fence work and so forth done and a proposal to go to city council rather than wait for measure dd to meet again i would like to delegate the authorization of that work to the agenda committee so wouldn't have to wait for the next DD meeting if that's necessary. Okay. And my comment, uh, as quickly as I can, refers to the uh, the fencing and the new fencing that's going in in that area. The work that I'm doing, which involves Lake Merritt and involves marine biology testing and nature, uh, uh, the animals that live there, uh, identification and reporting to state agencies around the status of those things on an ongoing basis. And it also relates to the channel. And I've been doing work with students in the channel. And now that this uh, fence is coming up, and it's gonna have four gates. And I got, what I'm gonna propose is that uh, I'm able to speak with you, Rebecca. Thank you so much for your work and Terry, because I think that I should have keys to the uh, gates. I think that the work that uh, we're doing with the stu uh, students and the testing and the restoral uh, marshland work that we're doing complements and uh, furthers our goal of meeting the permitting uh, uh, requirements that we're under 
and I shouldn't have to contact your department or some other department uh, asking, um, you know, if we can have somebody can show up and unlock the gate for us to get in there and do this work uh, when it's something that I can clearly describe and submit long beforehand in order to know what's being done and understand that it complements, again, the goals of uh, meeting the uh, permit requirements. So um, having said that, I, at first I thought this was not measure DD issue and I would take it up with you outside of Measure DD, but since Measure DD is paying for the fence, uh, uh, you know, I don't, currently when I go by there, I feel like a trespasser and uh, I don't obviously. Uh, oh, you're referring, you're, you're referring to the internal fence that was installed to protect the wetlands area, right, David? Yes, yes, the current fence that we put in. And that, that is right. And with an outer security fence, the issues that you're talking about is educational opportunities and all of the weed warriors and all of the training that would, used to be possible within that fence. All of those things should become, that's right, much easier. And the whole issue of even having that locked may not even be necessary that because we're locking up the outer fence at night and the inner fences uh, certainly could be accessible for everybody doing training and, and things of that nature. But I've written I, I, that you would like a key if it remains locked. And I will check and ask who I have to ask. But I hear you. I, I agree. I, I, I would like you to have a key. Well, the whole purpose of us putting up the fencing is to preserve the classroom setting. And so yeah, giving yeah. you access to that is right in line with what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And thank you. And the <laughs> issue issue of public safety for these young young kids and and doing all of that, that all of that should just go away with as a result of this external uh, fence. And uh, go ahead. And I, I want to say one thing. I want to make sure that we can get the go ahead to, I mean, we we need to spend this these remaining funds on this project. And I want to understand if there are objections, but it, we, 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 we need to use the Measure DD funds as fast as possible, the Series C. This is the only project that's ready. And um, we would like the blessing tonight to go ahead and and move forward with this project. So I'll, there are a lot of speakers, so I'm not sure who's first. Adrian? You know? uh, yeah, it's always in uh, top to bottom, but it's James, Myra, Jenny, and John are in order. So James? Well, I, I would certainly move that the uh, these these, this spending uh, be uh, be approved, be authorized. Uh, I would I would move that. Uh, Myra or Bob? Yeah, Myra, um, I, I, I not to put a spanner in the works, but this is seems to me an awful lot of money to spend for a fence, basically to keep encampments out. And couldn't it be an, I, a temporary fence? A, a chain link fence is not beautiful, but temporary fencing, if you in fact are going to have people come opening and closing the gates at night anyway, which some people might consider criminalizing homelessness, I don't know. Um, but why do we need this very expensive heavy duty fence? If uh, it may, if I may, yeah, I, I respond, think to, respond to that. Yeah, so there there are two two key reasons for the choice of this particular style of fence. One one is that it is an ornamental fence, far more in keeping with a park than like a chain link fence around what we see as a beautiful community resource, habitat, educational area. The other 
aspect is this fence needs to be up for 10 years. And therefore, the uh, needs for security, something that's durable, something that reflects uh, a park condition versus sort of a playground or some sort of temporary situation, I think it behooves, behoo you know, it's, it's part of the uh, design aesthetic of what this park is going to be like for 10 years. And so that's where we're coming from, something durable, something that is high enough to prevent easy getting over and into the park and yet something that provides a far more inviting fencing experience than your standard chain link fence. And I, I have to say, these numbers that you're looking at, please keep in mind that these so my security, the fence package is out for bid now. And if, as things are bought, as I award contracts, as the city awards contracts, I'm doing my best to give you the worst case scenario as to how much this could cost based on uh, a variety of of things that have come out of both the huge increase in construction costs due to the pandemic, but also the conditions of this particular site where we will have to be providing safe work zones using police force to protect workers. It, th these are fairly intense conditions that this construction work will go on until that fence and until we have uh, established, reestablished the park for public use. So these numbers carry a fair amount of cushion to protect us and you. And if you can see the 20% contingency, which is a quarter of a million dollars, as things get bought, those contingency levels keep dropping as I get more, you know, as I actually get people under contract and have real numbers that we're working with. Does that help at all? I, I will just go with, you know, whatever the majority of people think, but I, I just feel that you are still going to require police presence to clear the encampments. I mean, these fences are basically because people are camping, homeless people are camping in the park. And if you're going to be sending people and supported by police every night to make sure they don't come, then maybe if you did that without a fence, people would learn that they won't camp there anymore. And it would not, I mean, every fence is ugly. Oh. So I, one of the things that prevents that sort of flexibility, if you want to use the word flexibility, has to do with the protection of the plants that I'm putting in. And so the permit requirements are, so I, I, from my standpoint, um, I forget who I'm talking with. Is Katie, is it Katie who's? This is, this, is, this is Myra, Myra Redmond. Oh, Myra. <laughs> Sorry, Myra. <laughs> the, the, uh, any, any plant that is, so we have to go in with certain quantities of plants, all native plants, and the contractor is under warranty. He has to guarantee the survivability of these plants. So to take the risk of, uh, Further, further chances of people coming in and camping and doing kind of destructive, destructive activities, whether camping or just plain vandalism, means that the clock starts all over again. If I can't show that my plants that I put in in 2024, if I don't have 80% survival, that 
I have to have that contractor come back in, which will only increase the cost of my contract. If I can't assure this contractor that where he plants, where the city is taking care to make sure that they're not going to be all sorts of things happening to these plants that are outside of his control. His control is to water, to weed, to buy healthy plants, to install them properly, but it's not his job to protect them against public, public vandalism and harm and danger. So uh, the police are not going to be coming every night. The police will only be called if the security service is unable to remove to get people to uh, move, you know, leave the park when requested at night. And we're hoping that's right with time. The word will get out and that less and less people will try to camp there during the night. And at the end of 10 years, we'll have a lush and vibrant public space and wildlife habitat. Thank you. I just uh, I wanted to just say that, and we both wish for the same thing. Uh, Jenny and John? Jenny, Jenny and John? Good evening. I, I want to thank uh, Harold and Terry and Rebecca, uh, for your overall participation tonight, and Rebecca and Terry for this presentation. This is uh, worrisome. Uh, we've been working on this marsh issue for like five or six years uh, now, trying to get the plants there. I want to uh, second what uh, James said and and endorse the use of the funds to go ahead with this fence and an ornamental fence that we're going to be able to and enjoy looking at if you can enjoy a fence uh, rather than chain link. I, I think it, that's worth it, particularly with the um, civic auditorium coming back into use. Exactly, yeah. I want, I want to also say, just note, that it is bittersweet to be talking about our long sought, sought after wish list being no longer a possible, um, possibly funded here. Uh, so I, I just want to go on record that I'm not happy about that, but I do want to second what James said here. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. All right, John. I know it's late, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, as I envision what I will feel like um, uh, in Peralta Park, once this fence is built, uh, it will feel like uh, a prison yard because it will be surrounded on all sides by very uh, heavy fencing. I would like to suggest that with the fencing that is going to be installed under this project, you eliminate the need for the interior fence. And um, we, could, we could still put in a less obtrusive fence, I suppose. And the model that occurs to me um, is the uh, steel cable fence that the city installed in Diamond Park uh, to protect Salsa Creek. Um, but I don't think you need, what if you have this exterior fence, um, uh, I don't think you need uh, the, it, it eliminates the need for the interior fence. And I would well, like to, I, I would like to propose yeah. uh, either eliminating, uh, take interior fence uh, or replacing it with a less obtrusive uh, type of barrier. So I, I, I too have reflected on that, John, and thank you. Thank you very much for that. I would love to remove the interior fence. The reason I believe it should remain at least for the next five years or so, or for however long it takes to really establish this routine of locking this park up at night and eliminating any chance of, of people spending the night in there is that it's one thing to do a sweep 
a security sweep in that upper area of the park. It's another thing to have to go down into the wetlands to do a sweep to see who might be down in that area. And so for security's sake, for now, I would like very much to leave it up as a protection, not only for the wetlands, but to facilitate the public security, the public safety issues of what it means to sweep through that park in the evenings to make sure people are out. That the larger we make it, the easier it is for people to be hiding in this place or that place. And we are working hard to make the upland plantings within the current fence much denser and much more of a true uplands planting. So I, I hear where you're coming from and would respectfully request that we hold off on that decision for at least for the next few years or so. Well, well, that's a that's a fallback, I think. Yeah. If Rebecca, if you want, if we could specify uh, the conditions, which if met in three or four years, would yeah. result in the removal of that interior fence or rep replacement of the interior fence with a less obtrusive uh, type of barrier. I mean that's a that's a fallback. I mean. Okay. Okay. As long as you're open to that, that that's where I I I'd welcome getting rid of as much fencing as possible. But I hope you can hear where right now I'm thinking, it's it's a good public safety measure to maintain, at least for the next couple of years. So Rebecca, we like find a way to put a little tickler in the project folder so that in you know we we keep track of this i i yes, really absolutely yeah. thank you okay well, well i think what's important too is that the measure dd coalition also keep track of this because i think it's a it's a it's a very good idea to hopefully that things will turn around where we can get to the point <laughs> and eliminate the internal fencing and we can really exactly. change the nature that's there. Yeah. Yep. All right. I have uh, comments for two more people. If we could keep try to keep it short, um, 930. And I'd like to vote on this. I don't know if there's anything else we need to discuss after. So Katie, sorry. Yes. Um. So thank you so much, Rebecca. I just wanted to, um, having worked in that area with groups of young people and uh, hosting Earth Day and uh, activities there, I know the value of it. And I really appreciate the thought that has gone into the trying to protect the current situation. Um, so, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very difficult situation. And um, I, I know that when I've been out there, um, area where the areas easily breached are the ones that would be covered by the new fencing and that is needed. So, um, you know, the, I'm hoping and that the day will come soon that uh, we will be able to involve the public in planting and uh, science and stewardship in that area. Um, oh yeah. Dealing with the homeless in so many different places is, is difficult. And yeah. um, the status quo, I think, is not working, especially in this sensitive area when you have to meet the permit requirements. So um, we're not we warriors. <laughs> we're a different group, but we are uh, involving young people in stewardship and science. And we look forward to the day when we can all solve this um, in, in, and move forward and making that area available to the people of Oakland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, real quick, I put a comment in the chat, I, you know, if life gives you lemons, no one likes that fence, I, I would imagine, especially the price tag, uh, you know, consider surrounding the restoration with a buffer, uh, which would, could be, uh, you know, uh, children's, an, uh, an expanded children's playground in that area. I think a, a fence that, that holds the kids in is something that the parents might like. Uh, and certainly the hours set, uh, you know, kids aren't gonna be around during those evening hours. So. Um, you know, try to 
try to think outside the box a little bit for this one. If you're just going to spend this much money, um, just just a comment from the public, I guess. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I guess uh, I would. Um, uh, we've already had a movement to uh, to support the funding of the project. Um, is, is there any any objections to the city moving forward with uh, Measure DD money at this point? All right, hearing none, um, Terry, it's, uh, it's in your hands. Terry and Rebecca, thank you for thank you for the presentation and for taking it up. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and Stephen, so, so was that a positive? Was that a positive? Did I hear a motion to move forward? <laughs> yes, there was a there was a motion. It was. It was seconded. Okay, it was seconded. So oh, have, I missed yeah. that. <laughs> so, Rebecca, okay, you can BCR, you. the BCR of the funds can happen <laughs> to that do this. Very exciting. Thank you. I, thank and, you, all. And, Stephen Acker, I don't know if you want to say anything, um, but yeah, this is to, to spend Series C funding. Um, and, uh, I, it is 9.30. I um, am not sure how we should proceed, given that it's, you know, 33 minutes past when the meeting was supposed to end. But um, I can skip, I can kind of cover a few more things that I was supposed to report out on. And I wanted to say that until we spend, until we fully get a plan in place and make progress on spending down our series C funding. We cannot, I met with department of Bud, or finance. I cannot come with a conceptual plan for spending series D. We need to get through series C. So I'm, I am working on that. Um, I'm also, I've been acting for two and a quarter years. I, I have a lot going on and I'm, I am, finally have gotten some things taken care of that took a ton of my time and I'm going to be putting as much time into measure DD as I can. And I just, it, we continue to be understaffed. I'll be uh, adding some staffing at the mid April, which is really going to be significant. Um, and so I am, I'm working hard on this, but in the next two months, I am going to be really sitting down with Stephen Acker as much as possible so that we can develop a plan and, and carry it forward to spend down the Series C funding, which is in the way of us being able to move on to Series D. But I wanted to get to, oops, let me go back to this. Um, sorry that that was wrong, I'll correct that. Um, I wanted to talk about funding category two, which is waterfront access. So um, we did talk about Estuary Park, but uh, Fruitvale Land Crossing uh, Bay Trail segment construction completed and the trail is open to the public. So that was Christine Reed's project. It's done. Um, we, for this segment, which is 7th, East 7th Street to 23rd and 29th Avenues, this is this really difficult one. Um, you all, for our November 20th meeting, um, we determined that this project would be canceled due to excessive costs um, and excessive dur duration. Um, we had, and since the November meeting, we have had a discussion, the January meeting more about this project. And there's general consensus to go ahead and put this one on, to basically cancel this one and figure that maybe someday in the future, a trail can be located in this location. But right now we would be looking at replacing, pursuing bikeways via city streets and sidewalks for pedestrians. Um, but you all did ask me to come back um, to, to explain 
um, to look into what is DOT planning, Department of Transportation planning in this area, and um, what about the overwater trail idea? And so I went back to, to Rebecca's report to me, Rebecca Dar, who was also the project manager for 7th to 23rd. And um, we hired a consultant to do a an order of magnitude cost estimate. And Rebecca, what is the name of that firm? Or did you leave? No, I'm I'm oh. I'm here. What it's was the name? ARWS. ARWS. And yeah. um they they did this cost border uh, order of magnitude cost estimate. And they said that the water-based trail would cost about $51 million and the land-based trail would cost about $54 million. And that is assuming, you know, that as Rebecca said, that would include, um, you know, in the land-based trail, if we had to uh, acquire pot property and the cost of doing right of way and easement costs. So this is, you know, uh, uh, these are maybe high cost estimates, maybe not, but this is why we have determined that it is now is not the time for these projects. And I wanted to say about DOT, I did talk with Jason Patton in Department of Transportation and they have a, a pretty cool website that shows all of their um, all of their projects um, or their their planned projects. And I was able to. Well, I'm not even going to show this. I was planning to, but it we're out of time. I, the point is that they have a little project in their plan here, but they have no funding for it and no plan to build this project at this time. And I talked a little bit to Jason Patton about the on land project and um, to, to build trails. And it is not something that DOT is has staff resources to assign someone to, say if we had Series D DD funds in the future that could be applied to extending the Bay Trail in this location. And he was also talking about the fact that it's very complicated to do so. So we'll, I would like to put this on the agenda to talk about next time, the Upland Trail idea, because he and I just barely were able to talk about it a little bit. And I would like to talk, hear more perspectives from the DD Coalition about what folks are thinking in this area. And I also, I wanna have more time to talk to um, uh, Jason Patton in DOT about all of the, you know, their program and what conditions would need to be in place for them to be able to take on a project like there and if it could be or in that location and if it could be a collaboration of, of between OPW because we manage Measure DD and they're the ones who build um, bike and pedestrian pathways in Oakland. And so I, I want this to be a continuing conversation regarding the Upland uh, alternative, but I do wanna propose that we, at this time, agree to cancel the 7 to 23rd project. Every, like there has been general consensus among the Measure DD coalition to go ahead and, you know, uh, can cancel this, this project that this Union Point Park to 23rd Avenue Bay Trail project. And I just would like to mm, and, find and the park and the, and the Park Street Bridge trail connection. The two go together, right. just as your estimate shows. Right. The, the one cannot go forward without the other. Right. And so I can't get them permitted. I couldn't get them permitted. You had to have for for me to do the connection underneath the bridge, I had to have a place where it could land on right. the north side of Park Street Bridge. 
And for me to have a place to land, I had to create this trail coming down from East 7th Street from Union Point Park. And so the two had to work together. And so they're locked at the hip. And the bridge construction trail alone was it, it was uh, 20 million. <clears throat> and in the past, you all have, um, there's been general consensus. There have been a few folks who wanted to see what could be done about a possible water-based bridge. And um, I just would like permission to go ahead and cancel this project. And I don't know if we can come to that tonight because I would like to do the official paperwork on that. But um, I, you asked me to come back with this information, so I have. And um, there's there needs to be an ongoing conversation about this alternative uh, Bay Trail location in the, on the city streets. And in speaking with DOT, it's, it's a little bit complicated because it's a complicated area through there getting people across 23rd Ave. But yeah, so James, go ahead. I move for temporary uh, uh, cancellation of this project and, and to bring it back at a future time. Okay. Adrian? Um, well, I guess, uh, is, is, there any, is there any second? I guess my suggestion would be uh, to to just have it as an explicit item for next next meeting, but um, I'm happy to move it forward if others. And John, you're maybe the um, I, one who is pushing for the water trail. But. I'd I'd wait. I'd like to wait to make a decision on this. I'd like to spend some time looking at these figures. And I don't, I don't know, maybe maybe even throw a couple of questions at Terry between now and the next meeting. And, and I mean, I'd like to we, we should vote on the on Terry's proposal, but I'd like to do it at the next meeting. OK, that's fair. Uh, Jenny, a quick, a quick suggestion, uh, which might be that uh, those of us who are interested in walking the area that would become where the pedestrian and bikeway is and get a sense of what this detour at this time would look like. I'd like to suggest we think about that do, um, do before the next meeting. So we are, we're, we have a picture in our mind of what we're doing, talking about here. Yeah, and I would love to, I would meet you out there, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So let's, <laughs> Agenda committee, would you come up with a, a suggested time for those of us to meet Terry and and do this walk and look look at it? So we we're not talking about the theory; we're actually looking at the site. Sure. Uh, James, are you okay postponing the vote? Uh yeah. If uh, does that create a time problem for you, Terry? If it's postponed till the next meeting? No. Okay. All right. It's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. I withdraw the motion. Thank you, James. So, and just just to uh, add more fodder to your information here on these two different alternatives, the land-based uh, trail, which was the original concept. This this uh, estimate here for 54 million does not take into consideration the fact that in when I was doing the geotech and uh, environmental site investigations out out there at these sites, <clears throat> the outboard motor shop, as it says up here at the top, would absolutely not would not allow any trail across its property. And so it would mean full property purchase of an industrial site within the zone. And there's just no telling really when push came to shove how much that would come to. 
So while Terry was suggesting that these estimates might be high, on the contrary, I feel they are pretty conservative in light of how many years out any of this construction could possibly happen and the nature of what it would take to, if, if the land base were to go and the courts involved, I mean, there's just a significant amount of time and permitting that uh, is involved with this, with the, that trail. And the and it's city fact, council is very, very reluctant to use them in a domain to purchase property. So. Oh, and with good reason. Plus, in, in the city of Oakland is losing its industrial zones. And for the port of Oakland, which this is uh, definitely that whole tidal canal is as a resource through the gravels and things coming up and down there. It's an important resource to the port of Oakland. And mm -hmm. uh, and I, you will not find people wanting to uh, get this rezoned for public space or things like that. Over the water, it's different. This is this is doable, but I it is a huge lift with cost and the length of time required for it. So, so all right, thank that's you. All so I have to revisit it. Thank you so much for being here, Rebecca, and staying so long. And um, thank you to all of you for being here so long. Let, I'm looking forward to discussing this again. And John, please do reach out to me and Rebecca um, about this if, with your questions. You know, we are happy to answer them. Yes. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to sign off if that's okay. Yes. <laughs> I think All we right. have lost our, the director. But um, so. Good night, everyone, and thank you night. for thank your you, positive Rebecca. vote on Peralta Park. All right. Bye. Bye bye. So um, thank you. For Portland Creek Restoration Project, we're wrapping that one up. Um, here are some nice pictures showing all of the work that has been done in this project. So there have been some really big challenges, but Jennifer Stern and the RE are dealing with them in close coordination and collaboration with the contractor. It uh, Every project presents challenges, and this one is not unique, but we're making progress. Um, we don't have updates on these projects. Glenico Creek project is still stalled due to our workloads. Um, I'm gonna hopefully be picking both of these up soon because there is there are issues up at Beacons Build. And um, yeah, anyway, those there's an update date there for acquisitions. Um, we're working on a short list of purchases. In the Salsa Creek headwaters, we're looking at this project area. Nothing we, you know, we don't have. Um, we're just exploring possibilities, and we're looking at strategic tax defaulted sites. So we've, Mike is making really good progress, um, and hopefully we'll have something positive to report in the coming months. Um, uh, Long term, we're continuing to look at the landfill closure at Dunsmuir, Dunsmuir Chabot, coordinate with the city partners on reducing development pressure on vacant Creekside and other lands, and conservation easement monitoring. So we we are continuing to look into this, and we need to talk more with Stephen Acker about whether Measure DD funds could be used for easement monitoring or look for other funding for that. Um, so for Series C, we do have remaining funds that we need to spend as soon as possible. Um, we, in these different categories, we have about 1.2 million in Lake Merritt. So um, I would like to look at those wish list projects and figure out how we could spend this 1.25 million here. Um, in remaining funds, we have the 3.3 .3 million 
these are remaining funds that would include if we cancel 7th to 23rd and the Park Street Bridge, there's just a little funding left in both of those projects. And I've added that to this remaining funds count. So if for some reason we decide not to cancel those projects, I would subtract those remaining funds from there. And that would be part of the discussion as to how to spend this. But the fastest way for us to spend this money is on the estuary park project. And that is why we want to not be stalled. We want to look at how we could phase the project. We are, um, we're going to spend this remaining funding in category three on the Lake Merritt estuary connection. And we are, we have about 75,000 only left in the creeks and watershed area in restoration creeks and waterways restoration area so i i would like that if if mike needs this and has something excellent in the acquisitions realm i would like to propose using that for that project if we don't need it for one of our active uh, creek restoration projects or just putting this money into the glen echo creek restoration project and then we have these funds left in public art and DD administration. So that's as far as I could get with everything that I have on my plate. But like I said, Stephen Acker and I are gonna start meeting regularly so that we can get on top of measure DD. Um, yeah, so go for it. I'm not sure who's next, James or, or John. Yeah, let John go. Well, <clears throat> I, just, I just wanted to mention that the, the... Friends of Salsal Creek is uh, co-sponsoring a restoration uh, undertaking at William Wood Park. And I was at, I was at the meeting last week uh, that the, the Friends of Salsal Creek sponsored and Mike was there and he uh, presented information about some tax defaulted properties that are right on the borderline of William Wood Park. Yeah. And I'm just I'm just throwing this out there uh, because <clears throat> um, Mike was extremely helpful uh, and informative about what uh, some of the acquisition op opportunities might be uh, uh, adjacent to William Wood Park. So I I just wanted to throw that out there for your your information. Yeah, and I think at the and I I'm very aware and I think at maybe we'll have much better information about acquisitions for the next meeting. And so maybe we could invite Mike to come and give a, a little update on where we are with that. Okay. And, yeah, the, and the, the response, the, yeah, go ahead. The, the, the response to Mike's presentation was very favorable yeah. of, of okay. the people who were there. So great. And he's done a lot of uh, hard work looking at how that works from a real estate point of view. And so we've learned a lot and yeah, so he's making progress. We'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to spend that money as soon as possible. And he has really found some good opportunities. So go yes. ahead, James Van. I, I would like to move that Terry be authorized to, to us uh, if there are funds available that need to be, uh, spent quickly and it's convenient to uh, use some of those on some of the wish list projects that Terry be authorized to to make the selection uh, that seems most appropriate and be and to move ahead with with whatever she can uh, get accomplished from the wish list. Thanks and um I will touch base with um, Harold and Director Duffy about using Measure Q for doing the repair of the trail around Lake Merritt, but we do have, from what I can tell, 1.2 million in the Lake Merritt category, and we have these wish list projects, um, and these were prioritized through our CIP scoring criteria, and I think I have them in in order, but I'll double check that I'll put them in order. So I will I will communicate with the agenda committee about, and I will be looking into um, about this and I'll be looking into this and talking with 
project and grants management and facilities about what what we could what of these projects could be done quickly um, using the funding that we do have. So go ahead, James, do you have another comment? No, that was it. And uh, I guess I could add that after Terry has done her analysis that uh, a final authorization will be given by the, the agenda committee. Adrian, do you want to? Uh, does uh, anyone want to second that or um, propose another? Propose any yes, other? I want to second that. <laughs> no. Is there any, any objection to moving forward with that? Okay, great. Okay. So movement, thank you so much. Um, I think that was that was all I had. Um, it is eight nine fifty seven. Um, I appreciate you all uh, sticking around. Um, I really appreciate you being here too, Stephen Acker, to hear everything happening. And I will touch base with you, and you will. I'll be hopefully not bugging you too much. Um, but my yeah. So I. I will be making progress on all of this as quickly as I can. Um, I thank you for your patience with me. I am holding down about two and a half to three and a half jobs at any given time. And so I am, I need to put more time and effort into Measure DD and I'm trying to find the, the best way for me to arrange everything. Um, it would help if there would not be algal blooms in Lake Merritt, but we're continuing to, to work on that problem as well. And um, anyway, thank you for your patience with me. I am I am working hard and uh, trying to my best to deliver for you all. And this is gonna become, a, a, it is a very important, uh, it's a very important job on my plate and I am going to continue trying to prioritize it more than I have. So thank you for your patience. James, is your hand still up to yeah, say? It's for Adrian to recognize, uh, not on your report. Uh, go for it, James. Uh, I just move that the, unless they are critical items that must be discussed tonight, that we move the rest of the agenda to the next meeting, the next EV meeting. I very second that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, without any objection, <laughs> I assume. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, I, I did forget the one thing. Um, are we uh, authorized to? Uh, it, Persons who are willing to be part of work group to move ahead on this uh, land swap uh, housing taking away from Estuary Park. I, I, I've already nominated you and, and Bill. So and wants to second that. I'll accept if, if William does. So I'll accept half of the leadership of, uh, of that, yes. Okay, seems some hands are up. Okay. Um, Katie, did you real quick? I don't want anyone to miss. Um, Rotary Nature Center Friends has an upcoming lakeside chat on April 5th, uh, with the uh, um, Hillary uh, Powers on the spring birds at Lake Merritt. And also you will not want to miss um, Adrian's um, underwater videos of Lake Merritt. And I put the link in the chat. So if you want to see what it looks like down there, um, please uh, take a look at uh, those links. Um, it's really pretty fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, also, can I just say thank you to Hazel and Mandolin for being here so long. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Hazel. <laughs> And to everyone, really. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. I think we'll call it. Well, uh, Hazel on the agenda committee, we can touch base on the take action items tomorrow or over the next couple of days. Good night. Uh, Thank you, everyone. So, I want to say good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, all. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you.